I've made a mention before of how we, we came about with the name of Crosswinds and um, Brother Lee Smith uh, up in uh, Hernando, Mississippi, one of the uh, board of directors here for Crosswinds. Uh, me and him used to be co-workers, and we kind of, the name kind of came up because we were just joking around, you know, that, hey, man, if we ever started a church, you know, uh, he, he's got this just enthusiasm, man, just people love him. Uh, and, you know, here I am. <laughs> That's just me, right? But th- we got, you know, like, man, if we could, if we got together, Billy, we could, that would just be an awesome, you know, ministry that we could have together. Man, we're just like brothers that were separated at birth. It just uh, kindred spirits for sure. And we, I, I even mentioned the name. I was like, oh, man, we could do this and cross this, and then it would be crosswinds. And this was maybe two years, maybe almost three years before God laid it on our heart to start a church here. And so when God said, hey, I want you to start a church, the first name that popped in my head was like, it's got to be Crosswinds. God, you're not going to give me the, you're not going to give me the luggage before, you know, before the trip without, you, you know, making sure I'm got a trip coming up. So I kind of look at that and I, that's how the name came about. And you say, well, there's a lot in that name Crosswinds. And if you look at the aeronautical side, you know, if you're flying an airplane, this is one of the most dangerous things you ever want to come across. Uh, you can do a search on, you know, Google and you can say Crosswinds videos and they'll show you videos of planes that are coming in for a landing and that crosswind comes across the air, you know, the airstrip. And man, those planes are coming in sideways and they're zigzagging, you know, trying to get that lined up. And it, yeah, it can be a dangerous thing. Now, if you're talking about nautical, if you're talking about sailing, which down here, you know, close to the water, we're, we're going to use the nautical side of this. And it can still be a dangerous thing if you're sailing and that crosswind comes across the water. If you're not prepared, if your sails aren't set in place and proper, then that thing could catch the sails and it could tip your boat over. That's bad, right? However, with a church, I believe that Jesus is our captain. Amen? I'm just a first mate. That's all it is. Jesus is our captain. He is our high captain. And he's got control of that boat, and he's steering that thing, and he knows exactly the way the sails are supposed to be. So when that crosswind comes along and it hits those sails, he has enough presence of mind. I may not. But he has enough presence in mind that he can set those sails so that it catches that wind and it actually propels that, that ship forward. And that's kind of how I look at crosswinds. That when those winds of change come, when those winds of life start blowing across, that Jesus has enough mindset that he can take it and he can take the things that the devil throws at us and he can propel us forward. That's a good thing. Amen? That we want to continue making progress you know, with, with Jesus at the helm, that he is in charge. And as I got thinking about the name Crosswinds, and I got thinking about how it came about, and I wanted to give you all that little snippet of information, I got thinking about the names, and, and the names that we have and stuff like that. So I went ahead and I went to uh, meaningofnames.com, and I started looking at some of our names. And uh, mine, mine, mine name's handsome. You know, I think my parents nailed it just right on, amen. Uh, no amens. All right. So anyway, so my parents hit that, and I was like, "Wow, cool! I, I, that, that's that worked out just great." Uh, and then that means gracious. That's how we've been married for for thirty years because she's gracious. That's the only way. Uh, it's easy for me, you know, but for her, it's been woo. It's been a trip for her. Uh, Jerry is a, a form of Jeremiah, which means sent by God. I firmly believe that. It's a, that's it's cool how things come about in our life. Now, I didn't look up everybody's, um, but, you know, just give you a snippet. I want to make sure I got the kids, though, all right? Pax, and he's, I point over here because that's where he usually sits on Tuesday night now, uh, but Pax means peaceful, or if you want to look at, uh, you know, the European meaning of it, it means from a peaceful farm. He loves to go to Uncle Pony's, you know, uh, and we call him Uncle Pony. Usually, it's Uncle Pogie, and it's usually Mayhew. It's a long story. Um, but he loves to go and see the goats and stuff like that. So from a peaceful farm, I don't know if they're calling our family a farm or what the thing is, but that's, his name is Peace. Zion means sunny mountain or a sign. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid. He has a sunny personality. I guess it works, right? So it's, it's kind of cool. Get this. Enzo means conqueror or ruler or ruler of a home. So you got yourself. A <laughs> I was like, well, there you go. This little guy's going to grow up. And he, but it, it goes into like governor or, you know, ruler of people or something like that. And I was like, 
wow, that's pretty cool. Cause, you know that you know how these names come about. Uh, I even let's see, I, I did Doris, which means of the sea. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. Sean means, or as a, a, a diverative of John, which is a gift of God. I believe that. Uh, Sawyer, which is the new baby in the church. Uh, and you can pretty much almost get where that comes from, which is a, a woodcutter, which his dad does construction. So it's like, well, that just fit perfectly, right? Different customs of different people bring about different names. There used to be that uh, you would people be, uh, take on the surnames or pick on uh, pick up the last names. Like, you, you want to guess what the Baker family used to do? Bake, <laughs> right? You want to guess what the Smith family used to do? Smiths. You want to guess what the Black Smith or you know? And it's kind of like you can go on down through these lines of how people got their names. It also used to be from namesakes. People used to get their names from namesakes. That's why you get John Senior, John Junior, John the Third, you know, John the Fourth, John the Fifth different things like that, uh, from people's different names. My, name, my namesake was my grandpa, uh, Kenneth, and so I can, got that from him. So people used to do it that way. In some customs, what they would do is they would call the child baby, baby boy, baby girl, until they saw the characteristics of that child, and they would name that child based on the character traits of that child. Uh, and so it's kind of like, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, kinda, everybody's just baby boy, baby girl until that comes about. What's interesting is that when people get de- names that sometimes, except for the handsome part, that people end up picking up those characteristics of those names. And it's just kind of neat how that kind of plays about even when people get named early. You say, where in the world is all this going? That there's power in a name. There really is. And I pray that Crosswinds becomes a name that people are familiar with, not as, oh, that's just that church, those church people down there, but that it becomes that they say, hey, that is, that is a shining light of God in our community. That they may not be, you know, doing big things, but they are doing influential things. And sometimes there's a difference, amen? That they look in our life, you know, they look in their life and somewhere along the line, we've had a hand. You know, whether it was book packs one year, remember we did that? Or, you know, we, we helped to, to give some gifts to uh, some of the crossing guards that were here. We gifted, you know, a, a local homeless man. We've done batteries. We've done tires. We've done several batteries. Uh, we've, done, you know, we've done helping with payments on, on uh, electric bills. We've done different things. We've last year, if y'all remember, December, we we became a tithing church, and we you know sent four hundred dollars to four different uh, ministries around town for them to use. And it's kind of like, wow, you know, we got hands, you know, little little snippets of fingers of stuff that are going out into our community, and that's what we need to be. And we pray that our name becomes synonymous, not just with a handout, but that the hand of Christ is reaching out. That's we want that. We desire that, whether it's here locally in Gulf Shores or wherever you may happen to be living. In 1 John chapter 3, that's where we're going to head to. In 1 John chapter 3, and that's towards uh, the back of the New Testament, right before you get to Revelation. If you go from the back, it's Revelation, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. And we're going to look at chapter 3, and we're just going to look at the first five verses here that there is a phrase that is used in here, and we even, it was funny because we mentioned it uh, in the second song, we were singing it, uh, that, that we've been given a new name. And when we become Christians, we are indeed given a new name. And the interesting thing is that if you go to Revelation and start reading it, that we're given a new name that, that nobody knows but God himself. We don't even know. And I've heard people, you know, give uh, sermons and, and, and lessons and stuff and say, well, here's what that new name is. Well, if the Bible says that we're given a new name and nobody knows that name except for God, guess what that name is? We don't know. If the Bible says that nobody knows but God, guess who knows? God. I don't know it. You don't know it. And we can kind of speculate and say, well, I'm sure it's this. I'm the, you know, we can't do that. We don't know that. But here in 1 John chapter 3, we see that there's a phrase name that's given, a characteristic of people that we can grab a hold of, and we can say, you know what, that's who I am in Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, let's begin reading, and we're going to read the first five verses. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called, here it is, the sons of God. 
Now, we understand that sons of God is a generic term for a, a generation of siblings of Christ or a generation of offspring of God. So we would say sons and daughters of God. Now, we can be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons, the generation, the offspring of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath, uh, hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Let's go back to that first verse. In that first verse, we see that there's a, a man, it's, he starts off, Oh, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. I love that word bestowed. I use that, you know, especially when, that's kind of the word, a word that I use often uh, in, my, in my dinner prayer. You know, thank you for the, what you bestowed upon us. That's kind of one of the, my words that I pick up on. And it's bestowed is basically it's given, it's expressed, it's to lavish upon uh, or placed upon. It's something that has been put upon us. And man, I, is that, I love how he says that. Oh, what manner of... And see, we could dry read that when you say, Oh, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. I don't think that's kind of how he was saying it. It's kind of like this is the same guy that wrote John 3.16. And he said in there in John 3.16, what did he say? He said, for God so loved the world. And sometimes we can read that and we can re- reiterate it and we can you know, say it so nonchalant, if you were like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. No, 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 no. There, that so word in there adds an immense meaning to the word love. For God so loved the world. So when he's sitting here and he's saying here in verse 1, he's saying, oh, but what manner of, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That there is an expression of feeling because John was called John the Beloved and he was one that was always close to Christ. (coughs) He was there when Christ was doing the miracles and and people were loving him and he was also right there beside Christ when Christ was hanging on the cross and he saw the manner of love that was bestowed upon us. He saw one extreme to the other. He was there with Christ. He was one of the core friends, if you will, of Christ. Peter, James, and John were the trio that Jesus always kept close to him. And John was the one, and if you read 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, even, in, and usually John is the first, you know, when someone gets saved, I'm like, read John. Start with John. Read in John. Because why? Because in that, in the, in that book, John, as well as the other three, is that you see the personality of Christ and you see the manner of love. You, see, you feel it in his words. we got several people that, that come here that write books and, and have things like that and read. A lot, a lot of people read. And it's kind of like that y'all understand when you can read a book and it's just kind of like, okay, that's information I have. But then there's other books that you keep in your frequently read pile, right? And it's kind of like you go back to it and you read it and you can rec- you, you have that recollection of what you read. and you just cause, Why? Because there was so much meaning to it and you can feel it. And then that's got a, bu- a book that she's been reading lately and uh, I haven't read it. I just read the, the front cover of it. And uh, one of the expressions that is used by one of the people that, that, uh, that read it and kind of was given a, a uh, what you call that, uh, I can't remember what the word that I'm looking for. Anyway, as they, they were saying, here's what I think of this book. It said that as you turn each page, it's almost as if the page is, pages sigh as you turn them. It beca- it's like it's alive. It's almost like, oh, wow. It, every page bears meaning is kind of what they were saying. And that's the way it is when we start looking at the, at the book of John and 1 John and 2 John, 3 John, is that he's expressing the love of God in such a way that we feel it. In each verse, it's like, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, has placed upon us, has given us. That we didn't have to buy it, we didn't have to earn it, we still don't have to do that. That he willingly gave it to us. 
He bestowed it upon us. That's a beautiful phrase that he uses there, that we should be called the sons of God. You know, he could have just called us the property because he's bought us, right? We are bought with a price, with the precious blood of Christ. He could have just said the redeemed of God. He could, have said, he could have used so many different things, but God's desire was that we wouldn't just become a creation of his, that we would become him, that we would become as he is, that we would become part of the family of God. See, God created all things, right? All this is his. Every, everything that we see around us, all this is products that we may have manipulated into what we see as, as functional, you know, as chairs and stuff like that. But the metal that came out of the ground, that was his. It's still his. The products that are used to make the chairs, the carpet, the, the walls, you know, the clothes that we wear, all this is stuff that was, it is his. He could have just said, yes, you're part of my creation, but his desire was that we become more than that. That we would have that relationship with him. So much that he bestowed, there is that word again, that he bestowed the love of, of, of himself on us that we could be called the sons of God, the offspring of God. That we could be born of him. Yes, the world, you know, the end of verse number one says the world's not going to know us because it didn't know him. Verse number two It says, Behold, now are we the sons, the offspring of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We were talking about names a while ago, and we when we name children, we don't know what they're going to end up becoming. Right? You know, it's it's like we we name a child, and if they pick up characteristics of that name, that's cool. It worked out perfectly, right? Uh, But then in the end, it's kind of like we don't know if they're what what occupation they're going to pick up. We don't know if they're going to follow in, you know, their father's or mother's footsteps or granddad's footsteps. We have no clue until they get there, right? And that's kind of what the same thing is here. Is we've picked up the name of the offspring of God, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And that's great, but we truly don't understand what that means until we get there. Until we mature, until we get perfected in the sight of God. We don't understand it, and I've mentioned this over the last several messages that we've preached, that we really don't understand it because we can't grasp a hold of that. We kind of get an idea because we read the scriptures, we read, you know, what, you know, heaven's like, we understand, we we read what God's, it's kind of like, I can't grasp a hold of that. I can't grasp a hold of eternity. I really can't even grasp a hold of how salvation works. All I know is God says, this is what needs to be done. And it's like, I got to put my faith and trust that he's going to make that happen. How does God cleanse on the spiritual? I don't understand all the spiritual makeup of how all that works. I don't have to. All I need to know is that he can. And I'm going to let him do it. I'm going to put my faith and trust in him. So many times what we do is we lean upon our own understanding, right? Right? Is that we're like, well, I don't, and we, we hear this a lot when we're talking with individuals and we talk about uh, salvation, we're talking about, you know, redemption and stuff, and they're like, well, I don't, I, you know, I'll do that when I understand how that works. You're never going to, because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are much higher than man's. We can't even grasp a hold of how he can love us unconditionally. Why? Because more than likely we put conditions on love. We try to say that we want to love unconditionally, but it's very difficult for us to understand how he can do that. Why? Because he knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we do behind closed doors. He knows what we, you know, the, uh, the true intent of what we do. If we truly know, knew the intent and everything about each other, we would have a difficult time loving mankind. But God loved us even while we were still sinners. He sent his son to die for us. That's beyond my comprehension. That he could love me so much. You know what? But I'm going to trust him. I'm going to have faith in him to let him do. 
And I have that one, I have that hope, I have that, that moment that when I get there, when I attain, when I get perfection, when I get that glorified body, that I'm going to see him as he is because it says that I will be as he is. And when, I, when that happens and I see how great and wonderful he really is and I understand when you know, John says, behold what manner of love and I can see that love what it brings about, then it would be like, wow, this is so much more than I could have ever thought. So much more. And by then, I will understand why I can be called the sons and daughters of God. In verse number three, we see that he talks about a hope, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This hope, it's a promise, an anticipation, uh, a confidence, a faith. It is not a blind hope. It is not a, well, I hope so. I hope that's going to happen. No, it is a hope of anticipation and a confidence that he's going to be able to do what he set out to do. That he is truly the author and the finisher of our faith. There's a lot of times in our life where we set out to do something and you know it's kind of like, well, I hope I ever I hope I get that done. I hope I can I make it here. I hope I do this. I hope I do. And there's kind of that uh, this that thing inside of us. We say that word usually with an with this in, uh, this instinct in our in our mind, this instinct in our mind of saying that I'm not fully confident or sure that it's going to come about. So I hope it does. There's a difference when we're talking about what Christ is going to do for us. This hope that we talk about is not a, I'm not quite 100% sure that it's going to happen hope. It's one of those, I am 100% sure that I am confident in him that if he said he's going to do it, he will bring it to pass. That hope is that, that hope that springs eternal inside of us, that anticipation of the arrival. It's kind of like, I know it's going to happen. I just have to wait for it. We don't like to wait, do we? It's, it's that hurry up and wait thing. We have a hard enough time at a stoplight that's a minute and five, uh, 53 seconds. Come on, right? You know, some of them are geared about that, that level. Or if you get some traffic lights, there's one traffic light I know in particular, it's pretty much a, a three and a half minute, you know, light because I can listen to almost a whole song before it changes. You get those, right? And it's kind of like, okay, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And you wait, and you wait, and you come on, right? Same thing in our life. We don't like to wait. But isn't it wonderful to know that while we're waiting on his return, that we know that he's got our future in place, he knows that we know that it is set in him, and we don't have to worry wait, right? You ever had that where somebody might have been coming in town, and they're like, yeah, we're on the road, and you have no idea where they're at. They're coming down through the dark backwoods of Mississippi, and you, and you, you can't follow them on GPS anymore. And you're like, where are they at? You know, and they're like, well, you, we're, we're coming. We're making it. And so then you, you don't talk to them for a while, and it's kind of like, well, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I have this hope that they're coming, and I have this anticipation for coming, but it's that worry wait, right? We don't have to do that in Christ. We don't have to worry, wait. Why? Because he will bring things to pass that he has promised. Verse number four, we're not going to dwell so much on four because I wanted this message to be a, a positive, uplifting, encouraging message. And verse number four, is, John threw this in there. It's kind of like, why did you do that? Through the inspiration of God. That's what his answer would be. And he threw this in there because we have this uplifting first, you know, verses one, two, and three. It's kind of like, we are sons of God. God's loved us so much. This is great. We have a hope. And then all of a sudden he throws verse number four in there. And it's like, whosoever committed the sin transgresses against the law for sin is the transgression of the law. It's like, Man, what a downer. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, here you are building this up. And then all of a sudden, at the end of verse number three, you say, talk about purifying yourself. And you could have left it at that. But then God threw in verse number four. And it's like, here's what sin is. Sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is when we go against God's will in our life. So we're just going to kind of let that lie. We all know what it is, right? We all know what we might have in our life that God needs to work on. But we're going to look at that because we want to see that in verse number 5, there is a promise, there is a hope, there is a, an anticipation, there is a blessing that we see in verse number 5 that even if we mess up on verse number 4 and we transgress and we sin, verse number 5, look what it says. It says, 
in verse number five, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whew. Man, what a relief, right? Because we know we have verse number four in our life. We know we do things that we're not supposed to. We know that we don't do the things that we should do a lot of times. But in verse number five, we see that there's a blessedness when it says, but we know that he was manifest, that he was brought into place, that he was made to do this for us. If we go to the book of Luke, and we'll, of course we'll hit Luke in you know, Luke chapter 2 in a few weeks when we're talking about the birth of Christ. And it's in the angels were declaring to the shepherds, and they said this. They said, Behold, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Why do we have to have a Savior? Why do we have to have him manifested in verse number 5? Because we have verse number 4. And instead of us focusing on what we do or don't do that becomes sin in our life, let us focus on verse number 5 or, you know, in Luke chapter 2, that there's a Savior, there is a cure, there is, you know, and there's people that, that do this, and there's a big push for people. Uh, Miss Doris is one of those that, hey, don't speak the evil into your life. Speak the healing. That if, if you got something going on and the doctor says, hey, you got something wrong, don't dwell on the wrong. Look at who can fix that wrong and dwell upon it and speak into that. And so many times what we do is we're like, man, I got this sin. As the, as the Bible says, that sin that does so easily beset me that I keep tripping over, that I keep doing. And it's like, man, I have this wrong in my life. I do this wrong all the time. Yeah, if you keep focusing on that, doing that wrong, guess what? You're still going to do it wrong. But instead of doing that, let's look at verse number five. God, I am so thankful that Jesus was manifested, that he was brought to this earth, that you allowed him to come, that you sacrificed him so that I don't have to dwell on verse number four. I can hit verses one, two, and three, skip four because of the grace of God, hit verse number five because he takes it away. I don't have to worry about that anymore. If I confess it, he forgives it, he forgets it. That's awesome right there. And we can do that because we are sons and daughters of God. That's good news, amen? And there are people around us that need to hear that. We have a wonderful opportunity over the next four weeks. Over the next four weeks, we have a wonderful open door that we can speak into people's lives. Why? Because I was, in, you know, we were at the store last night. Man, that was that was an awesome shopping experience last night. There was like nobody there, you know, and it's like, man, this is perfect, you know, and it's in between seasons right now, you know, and of course the big game was on yesterday, so a lot of people were still at the house, and some people were crying, some people were rejoicing, yes, you know, and it's kind of like one of those moments, I'm sorry for everybody I just offended, but that's all right, you know, the Bible says that offenses shall come. You know, it's just kept, you know, it's one of those. You know, it was one of those nights where everybody was out off doing something, so there was nobody at the store. And as we're going around and we're shopping, I could hear the music, and it started talking about "For unto us is born," and it talked about Jesus being born in this world. And I was like, man, there is no excuse for somebody that lives in this country to not know about Jesus Christ. We have an open door of opportunity over the next four weeks when people are singing joy to the world, the Lord has come, for us to look at them and say, you know what that song's about? Do you know who that away in a manger is talking about? Do you know who this Jesus is born unto us this day? You know, do you know who, that's talk, who that song is written about? Either they're going to say yes or no, right? And we can speak into their life and say, you know what? All of us are born in verse number four. All of us are born, you know, outside of the will of God. We are born in sin. But God loved us. God bestowed so much love upon us that he sent his son, Jesus, whom we're singing these songs about, to die for us, to manifest so that he could take away our sins, verse number five. Let's go and tell. Shout it from the mountaintops, whisper it in the corners that Jesus Christ has come to save us. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this time we've had this morning. That God, that we can focus on your word. And God, we are so thankful that you desire us to be called the sons and daughters of you. 
that you desired it so much that you came yourself in the form of your son, the second part of the Trinity, to be born in the lowest state and to be brought up into this world sinless uh, through your son, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He was made manifest to take away our sins. God, we thank you for that. God, we pray for this invitation time. That God, that we be mindful of your heart. That God, as we pray, our focus will be on your will for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. During this prayer time, I pray that that's our focus this morning. Whether you're here locally, or if you're watching by way of Facebook Live or YouTube. Our heart's cry this morning is that we will pray for His will to be done. That our prayer would be that of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane as He's about to pay the ultimate sacrifice where He cries out, Father, not my will, but thine be done. May that be our prayer this morning while we pray.